This year, uh, the PAMETC committee has made two nominations for the Distinguished Researcher Award. So it's my great pleasure uh, to announce the second awardee. Um, so he, he is one of the fathers of convolutional networks and deep learning, making uh, foundational contributions in, in those areas. So he and his colleagues have developed lots of the techniques in the 80s and 90s. But it's only now, more than 20 years after that, when they really have stormed our field and making a huge impact. So with that, um, let me welcome on the stage Jan Lekun. Okay, uh, well, I'd like to thank the, the committee. Uh, this is a great honor. I'm very, uh, very uh, flattered. Um, and I'd like to thank the community as a whole uh, because I think that, I'm gonna come back to this during my talk, I think the uh, computer vision community is a very welcoming one. I joined the computer vision community around 1997. I started hanging around at CVPR in various workshops and I was invited to a lot of workshops and had a lot of very interesting debates and discussions with, with many of you and I learned a lot from it and um, uh, it took a while for those ideas to kind of pop up to the front but, um, but it was all a very interesting uh, process. Um, so, you know, before computer vision started paying attention to uh, convolutional nets and, and machine learning even, um, uh, you know, the, there's a lot of work which was kind of under the radar because the domain of applications were really not real images. There were things like uh, toy uh, problems, you know, uh, digits that were drawn on a, you know, with a mouse or something like this. That's kind of all we could afford. It was very difficult to collect data and it was di very difficult to run them on, we didn't have fast computers. But the basic idea of sort of convnet-like architectures came, you know, when, you know, goes back to the 1980s, uh, probably even earlier. In fact, in the 60s, you find in the original papers uh, from Rosenblatt and, and the followers, there are papers that point to the idea that you need multiple layers in, in neural nets. But, uh, but people sort of run out of money, essentially, before an interest from the community, before they came up with a good idea to train those models. There was a large number of attempts in the 60s and 70s to come up with uh, learning algorithms for multi-layer multi -layer systems, but they were either uh, uh, correct and ignored or not properly implemented or people didn't realize they were actually usable in the context of machine learning uh, or they were designed for that purpose but didn't quite work and was you know, mostly, uh, mostly ignored. I think um, a piece of work that really influenced me when I started to get in this field when I was still an undergraduate student, engineering student, was Fukushima's neurocognitron. It really has this idea of um, replicating filters and have, you know, having pooling areas that are complex cells, basically the sort of getting inspiration from Hubble and Weasel. When I read this paper, I thought this is a, a wonderful idea, but the learning algorithm is all wrong. It was, it was kind of a hack. A, lo a lot of it was sort of winner-take-all learning with a lot of adjustable parameters. And I thought this was very unsatisfying. There's, there's a, a huge number of hyperparameters you have to tune just right, just so, so that it works. Um, and so I, I, I started to look for um, ideas that would um, allow a system to be trained end-to-end. -end. And it's been kind of my, my obsession since the, since the early 80s, really. Um, so first when I was um, a master's student, really, but early in my PhD, uh, my, my PhD work, I came up with a model I call HLM. I'm not going to tell you. It means hierarchical learning machine, but it also it's a pun because HLM in French also means kind of you know cheap housing projects, and um, you know lots of little things that are replicated in kind of lots of different layers. Um, and I used a, a kind of algorithm that is somewhat similar to backprop, but but you know. A, a little bit different that uh, we would now call target prop. So the idea is not to 
backpropagate gradient, but to essentially figure out a virtual target for every unit in the system. And when you kind of make a special case of this algorithm, it kind of reduces the backprop. Um, I think there's a lot of value actually to algorithms of this kind, and they're kind of coming back a little bit in, the, um, uh, in fashion. There's a couple of articles by Yoshi Benjo and others on, on the topic in recent years. So then, uh, a few years later, um, of course, backprop um, was kind of worked out, and it was pretty clear how to make that work. And uh, Jeff Hinton, in one of the early papers on backprop, came up with the idea of sharing weights across, uh, across location. Of course, he knew about Fukushima. Um, and he applied this to a you know, sort of classic Jeff Hinton on the, on the toy problem at the time. Um, and it, it was kind of very difficult at the time to really sort of implement the software to make this work. You know, this, the, um, the kind of ease with which you could develop software was not the kind that, that, we, that we do now. And so it took a little while to kind of develop the tools that gave us enough um, flexibility to, to run ConvNet. So that happens around 1987, 88, when I was actually a postdoc in, in Jeff's lab. I'd started working on the tool um, to, uh, to play with those things. Um, and, and it was pretty clear that this idea of shared weights was kind of improving the performance of the systems where you had a relatively small amount of training data. As soon as I joined Bell Labs in 1988, I started applying it to real, real prob problem and um, I got really good results on uh, digit recognition for the US Postal Service. Um, and, and, and very soon we realized that the, the, the real problem was not to recognize individual digits, of course, but what you want is to be able to recognize an entire word. And so you have to solve the, the segmentation problem as well as the recognition problem. If the characters touch, there is no obvious way of doing it. So we came up with this idea, which I guess some people now in this community call fully convolutional nets. And it's the idea that you can essentially replicate a, a, a convolutional net over an entire large field, and what you get at the output is not a single output, but one output for every possible location on the input, um, and, um, and basically a score for every window uh, uh, that the, the system sees. Uh, so that was 1991. Uh, we're able to do sort of multi-digit uh, character recognition with no prior segmentation. But this was very expensive computationally. So eventually, when we uh, started to, to work on, on real systems for, uh, say, check reading, we actually reverted to sort of heuristic segmentation combined with, with uh, convolutional net focused on a single character. But eventually, we, moved to, we figured that we could use this to uh, process natural images. And we started actually building a face detector in 1993, which worked pretty well. This was sort of our first real computer vision application, if you want. Uh, but it was published in sort of an obscure journal in, in Britain and um, basically never captured the attention of the computer vision community, um, which tells you that you have to publish in the right places. Um, eventually, uh, the work on handwriting sort of um, uh, uh, peaked in the, the mid-90s when we built a fairly complex system that was trained end-to-end -to, -end to recognize character strings and that combined heuristic segmentation, convolutional nets for recognition, and something that we would now call a CRF for uh, kind of taking into account the, the grammar, if you want, of, uh, of the, the string that's being recognized. And that was around 1996. And the day we um, fielded that system um, was also the day that at and announced that it was breaking itself up. And our team, which was a combination of research scientists, engineers, and, and sort of product developers, was kind of broken apart. And so I stopped working on this for a while. Um, I worked on something else from, from 1996 to 2002, and that's probably one of the reasons, perhaps, that convolutional nets were kind of under the radar for quite a long time. So this is w what it looked like back in the, the late 80s, um, the neocognitron on the top right, the, uh, some of the early models I played with uh, below, the first convolutional nets um, that I played with in the, the bottom right. And you know they evolved pretty quickly to things that could recognize real characters. Um, and uh, the idea of sort of combining uh, convolutions and pooling, the first uh, models were too expensive for that. So what we had were convolutional layers where we had uh, a, sort of a, a stride, if you want. So the, the resolution of the output map was less than the resolution of the input map due to subsampling. We didn't have a separate subsampling layer. But eventually we figured out the subsampling layer, we could afford it, and, and it worked better. So we started doing this. Um, and we're able to do those kind of multi-digit recognition by swiping over, uh, over a field and uh, basically with a little bit of post-processing being able to do the simultaneous segmentation and recognition and kind of post-processing as well. Um, and that's kind of a complex thing of the check reader, which I'm not going to go into. 
Um, so phase detection worked pretty well in 1994, but again, um, the time was not ripe for this. And that's about when I started to hang out with computer vision people around 1998. Uh, I was invited to a couple of workshops and started, I, I went to CVPR my first time in 1997. Um, I had a paper actually on this check reader, um, which nobody cared about, um, and which had convolutional net. So this first paper on convolutional net at CVPR was in 1997. And convolutional net was actually a kind of a side thing because that was kind of an old idea. The real idea was how you integrate this into a globally trained system with a CRF. Uh, this was actually, you know, four years before the, the CRF paper that everybody cites. Um, um, and I found this community, as I said, very, very welcoming. So I participated in a lot of very interesting workshops in interesting places like Sicily and, you know, Lake Como and uh, Snowbird, which, which is one I, I uh, organized. And I sort of tried to bring together the, the machine learning community and the computer vision community. And I think that had a big impact. I can't take credit at all for that impact, but although I had a little bit of influence in it. But I, I think a lot of people who should get the credit for this are people like Jitendra, uh, Jitendra Malik, um, uh, Marcel Hébert, Jean Ponce, Cordelia Schmidt, um, um, uh, David Forsythe. Uh, those people were, I think, um, very interested, very skeptical about those techniques to some extent, but very interested as well. Um, and, um, and we had a lot of fun. I gave a... Uh, I was invited to give a, a keynote speech at CVPR in 2000, uh, which was kind of an interesting event because my laptop crashed in the middle, so I had to revert to using slides. But, um, uh, but one of the things that I presented it was kind of the, the grand scheme of my ultimate model for computer vision, if you want, which is sort of end-to-end -end learning where you integrate localization, detection, segmentation, recognition and kind of post-processing, contextual post-processing, if you want, in sort of one big multi-stage system that is trained end-to-end. -end. And I still believe this, uh, this model had a lot of value. And in fact, there is a lot of paper at this conference and previous ones in the last two years that sort of attempt to do this, really. Um, so, uh, so progressing, um, th there was sort of a period between 2005, roughly, and 2010, 2011, where um, deep learning systems were working okay. They were sort of about the same as sort of alternative methods, but not significantly better. And the reason was mostly because the data sets were too small and the machines were too slow. And so if you work with Catech 101 or with the INRIA data set for pedestrian detection, you don't have a lot of training data. And if you train a, a giant neural net with tons of parameters, the performance you get is not that great. So what that drove us to do is to find architectural tricks to improve the performance with a small number of training samples. And we came up with this one trick that turned out to be very useful, which is um, rectification, um, what we now call ReLU, and max pooling. Uh, max pooling had been floating around before um, in, in other similar models, uh, but not in the context of uh, networks trained with backprop. And you know, several people were working on it, Yosha Benjo's lab, uh, Jürgen Schmidhuber's lab, and, and certainly Jeff Hinton's lab. Uh, but that kind of this idea sort of came to the fore and we came up with a recipe and the recipe is have a bunch of, uh, you know, convolutional layers, the nonlinearity is just a half wave rectification, um, then the pooling is a max pooling and you do subsampling at the same time and you stack many layers of that. Um, so uh, around 2010, um, we started getting really good results on some data sets that were big enough for, to constrain all the parameters in the system and that's an example of this. This is a, a, a video of a, uh, a sort of a replicated convolutional net over a large image that, that performs semantic segmentation. So it's trained to essentially tell you the category of, uh, um, of the uh, objects that every pixel belongs to, right? Get a pixel, tell me the category of the object that th this pixel is in, is in. And this works really well. Um, and this, this was kind of a, a sort of a low point in my interaction with the computer co vision community, if you want, because uh, we submitted this paper to CVPR 2011. Uh, or maybe it was 2010, I think it was 2000, one of the two, um, I think it was 2010, and, um, and, and it, was, it was the first time that I sent a paper to, it, it was very difficult to get any paper accepted in computer vision that had convolutional nets in it because not enough people knew about it. So although the senior people in the field thought this was interesting, most of the reviewers had no idea what a convolutional net was, and so it was very difficult to kind of get, um, uh, to get those papers in. And that tells you something about the, the kind of, uh, some of the sort of defects, if you want, of our reviewing process, which have commented on actually uh, at length. Um, but, um, 
what happened there is that it's one of the first time where I said, you know, I'm really sure we're going to get uh, this paper accepted because we're beating three, you know, the result by pretty large margin on three data sets, and it's 100 times faster than the best runner app. And so what could go wrong? Uh, and the reviews were, again, it was, the paper was rejected uh, to the extent that we actually pulled it before the response because uh, we didn't know how to answer to the, to answer the reviewers. The reviews were basically people who didn't know what the convolutional net was and were in complete disbelief that this was working, um, that a, a technique they'd never heard of could, could do something like this. And this was, you know, late 2010. Um, and so I sent a letter to Serge Belongi, who was the program chair at the time. And I had been program chair of CVPR before, so I knew he had nothing to do with this. But, uh, but I said, you can publish the letter. And I said, you know, the, the reviewing process is, you know, is, is imperfect. I understand that. You know, um, it, it's true of every conference. But it's a bit of a waste of time for me and my students to, and a waste of energy also to submit papers when there is essentially no reviewer who, are, who know the, anything about this. And so uh, we, um, we uh, resubmitted the paper to ACML, where it was accepted. Um, and Serge actually published a letter. He anonymized it, but, um, but of course, everybody knew who it was. Um, and, um, and it sort of, um, you know, perhaps made me look like I was a little angry. I wasn't. Uh, but, um, but it was sort of a, a way of saying, you know, uh, the, the field is not ready, basically. Um, and the, the component we used for this application was fairly sophisticated. It was kind of a multi-scale um, multi system. It was kind of hard to explain to someone who doesn't know what a component is in the first place. Um, it's been a world of difference since then. So in the, about one year later, uh, one year, a year and a half later, perhaps almost two years later, uh, was uh, ECCV 2012, where the uh, ImageNet competition was won by Alex Kujewski, Elias Eskever, and Jeff Hinton. And all of a sudden, everybody started to learn what a convolutional net was, to the point that now it's very difficult to get your paper accepted at this conference or at CVPR if, unless you use a convolutional net in your system. So I've, I've never seen anything like this before, where there is su such a, a complete change in, a, in, a, in opinions you know, from one extreme to the other. I think n neither of those is good. I think you know, it's, it's very good when we have diversity of ideas and we are kind of open to uh, new ideas, even if they don't beat the record on some data set uh, immediately. Um, so in 2011, I, uh, uh, there was a, a workshop that was organized by um, Oliva and Alan Ewell called Frontiers in Computer Vision at MIT in summer 2011. And this was just around the time of this, um, just after this, uh, this paper. And I made a prediction. The title of my talk was, five years from now, everyone will learn the features, and you might as well start now. I was actually wrong. It took a lot less than that. Um, I mean, we are just about five years later now, maybe four and a half years later. Uh, and, and that's kind of the case. The other person who made the same point is David Lowe. He gave a talk just before me, and he basically made the same point. He said, you know, those hierarchical architectures where you learn all the filters, that's, that's where the future is. And he was right. It's kind of intimidating to speak right after you, but it's also great because you introduce a lot of things that I don't have to, to talk about. That's, that's wonderful. Um, in 2012, wow, you know, everything changed, uh, basically because of large data sets and fast GPUs. And we all know what happened on, you know, the, the quick progress in recognition uh, performance on, as, you know, single object recognition and how people now can do simultaneous location segmentation, you know, captioning. And in fact, the, the amount of stuff that's happening now in the field is just mind boggling. I have a hard time keeping track. In fact, I have so much of a hard time keeping track that there are certain things that if you told me five years ago, convolutional nets are the best method for this, I would have said no way. Like face recognition. Like I thought convolutional net back then was, were kind of ideal for you know, category level recognition for a relatively small number of categories. But for fine grain recognition, you'd be better off using something like you know, a bunch of SIFs and like, you know, things that are really focused on very uh, distinguished, distinguishing features, you know, very uh, discriminating features. So I was, it turns out it works very well for face recognition. I was completely wrong. Uh, so there's amazing work at, at Facebook, actually, in my group, Facebook Air Research, by uh, Yaniv Tagman and his team on, on face recognition. And it's essentially giving superhuman performance, not superhuman in terms of robustness, in the sense that the system still wants kind of frontal views, if you want, more or less, uh, with some, some flexibility, but in the sense that uh, it can pick out a person among 20,000. 
and just give you a name and um, in the fraction of a second. In fact, we can do a lot more than this with you know, less performance. Uh, so that's, that's kind of amazing. Um, all other amazing things that have happened are things like transfer learning, which um, I guess David alluded to in the answer to the, to the question, where you, know, you train a, a convolutional net on lots of on a standard data set like ImageNet, and then you can just retrain a couple layers or, or, or you know, a few, uh, just one layer on a few samples, and you basically get a good recognizer for this new category. Uh, people are doing this a lot, and there's a lot of paper on this uh, here. Uh, fine grain categorization, as I mentioned, object segmentation localization, uh, you know, facilitated by the Cocoa competition, uh, image captioning, visual Q&A, um, and then there is this kind of new uh, field where people kind of uh, take the commercial net and sort of reverse it and use it as an image generator. Uh, so this, this was first um, done in the early 90s in a, a paper that I wrote with Patrice Simard where we tried to kind of generate trajectory using what we called at the time a reverse TDNN. So a TDNN is sort of a, a, a temporal commercial net if you want. Um, but, um, but more recently my, my friend and colleague uh, Rob Fergus uh, worked on a model called the deconvolutional net, which is sort of a, a convolutional net where you reverse all the arrows if you want, and you can use it backwards to generate images. He used it as kind of a recognition model, which was okay, not particularly good, but okay, uh, and relatively inefficient. But the DVU's plan was to actually eventually uh, turn it into sort of an image generator uh, and maybe marry it with a kind of a feedforward path, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit later. Um, then there's a bunch of new ideas that have really come to the fore, um, particularly something called adversarial training, which uh, allows people to you know, train systems to generate images. I'm going to show you some examples. And then the surprise was that um, there's two surprises in terms of network architectures that we wouldn't have thought were true um, just, just 10 years ago or five years ago, which is that if you make the networks bigger, fatter in some way, um, they work better. They don't overfit somehow. They just get better if you make them bigger. Um, and the other thing is that they work better if you make them deeper. And uh, you know, all of you, I'm sure, have heard of uh, Google Net and VGG, which have on the order of 20 layers, if, if, if not more. And um, um, there, there is, uh, you know, a paper that just just circulated on archive related to the Cocoa competition and the, the latest ImageNet competition from MSRA, where they train a commercial net with 150 layers. Of course, using tricks. It's not back properly away. There's kind of a few incremental tricks there. Um, but they get extremely good performance with that. So face recognition really works. It uses a, a trick called metric learning and embedding. So embedding methods, uh, or metric learning methods, as they're called. Again, something that David Lowe is a pioneer of. Is there anything you haven't done? Um, uh, this works really well when the category, number of categories is very, very large. So what you do is you train a network to not to produce uh, a category, but to produce a vector in such a way that the Euclidean distance in that vector space, or cosine distance in that vector space, corresponds to identity. So you show um, two images of the same person, and you tell the system, I want those two vectors to be near. And then you, two, you show two images of different people, and you tell the system, I want those vectors to be far away from each other. And eventually, the system runs a function that maps into this kind of embedding of, of phase space, if you want. It works really well. Um, in fact, we use this for a lot of things that um, at, at Facebook, and a lot of people use those techniques for not just for images, but also for text and, and, and audio and all kinds of stuff. So these are the, 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 deep, the deep network of the you know, second to last generation. The, the new one is just coming up this week. Uh, many, many layers. And we can do things now like marry, uh, along the same line of ideas I was talking about before for the check reader, we can marry convolutional net with graphical models, CRFs, if you want. Um, so as to kind of come up with consistent interpretations of ambiguous images where we can do things like figure out the pose of a person, even for the limbs that are not seen, um, just because of the consistency of the shape of a, of a body. Um, there's really interesting work on caption generation, um, but it, it's, it's not as impressive as it seems. Uh, there's a lot of people working on this who basically all get the same performance, all with very similar models. Uh, and the limitation of the performance here is not due to the models, but due to the data sets. The data sets are not rich enough. The number of sentences that need to be generated to do a good job at this is not very large. The perplexity is not very large, if you want. And so it looks like we're getting good performance, but in fact, um, it's not really practical. Um, I'm gonna, um, of course, we can do you know, video 
classification. You guys know about this. You know, just add a dimension to your convolutional net, so now it does spatial temporal uh, classification, and it works. Actually, I'm going to show you a little video which has some audio. This was put together by uh, a colleague at Facebook called Vincent Chong, who builds demos. Is there a baby? This is visual question answer. Yes. What is the man doing? Typing. Is the baby sitting on his lap? Yes. Are they smiling? Yes. Is there a baby in the photo? Yes. Where is the baby standing? Bathroom. What is the baby doing? Brushing teeth. What game is being played? Soccer. Is someone kicking the ball? Yes. What color is the ball? Yellow. What game is the dog playing? Frisbee. What color is the dog? Black. Is the dog wearing a collar? Yes. What is the cat sniffing? Banana. Where is the cat? On bed. What color is the cat? Black and white. What color are the bananas? Green. That's an example of what we can do now with, uh, with um, visual Q&A. And there's a lot of systems of this type. Uh, this is the one built at Facebook. Um, again, the performance of this is limited by the data set, not really by the models we have. In fact, it doesn't quite matter what models you use. You pretty much get the same performance. I mean, you, you have to use a, a good convolutional net, but on top of it, you can use a recurrent neural net, a memory network, uh, you know, a kind of a phrase selection, things like this. And they all pretty much, you know, back of word, they pretty much all work the same. This uses, uh, use, this uses a model developed by Facebook or memory network. So people have, have used now convolutional net for generation, and this is um, work by uh, uh, Dosovitsky et al. that was published uh, about a year ago. Um, uh, where the kind of views of, of different chairs is parameterized and the system is trained supervised mode to map instantiation parameters of a chair to an actual image of a chair together with a mask. And, and so what you get now is a parameterization of the space of chairs and you can you know, interpolate and generate chairs in that space and that's kind of cool. Um, the similar work, um, extension of that work which, where here you have sort of an autoencoder, so you have a convolutional net that sort of extracts a code and then a deconvolutional net that sort of uh, from the code generates an image, and is trained on, on faces uh, where the, the, the sort of instantiation parameter again are, are kind of uh, trained supervised or sometimes inferred from uh, uh, probabilistically by through a kind of latent variable inference model. And you get again a sort of parameterization of faces and lighting and things like this. So I, I think this is all very um, uh, very impressive. I want to end um, with one thing I just want to talk about, which is unsupervised learning. And um, uh, David said uh, earlier that unsupervised learning was the, the way to the future. And you know, you gotta listen to him when he says things like this because he's usually right. Um, but I'm, um, I'm, I totally agree, I think. So there's a joke I'm saying actually, which is that if you think of learning and intelligence as a cake, the cake itself is unsupervised learning. Most of the learning we do is unsupervised. The icing on the cake is supervised learning. Almost everything we do in this conference is the icing on the cake. And if you work on reinforcement learning, that's the cherry on the cake. So why am I saying this? It's because um, when you do reinforcement learning, you're giving very, very little information to the system. When you do supervised learning, you're not giving a lot of information to the system. You're not asking it to predict a lot of things. You're only asking it to predict a category. But when you do unsupervised learning, you're basically asking it to predict the future. And this is what, one of the things we've been trying to do here with convolutional nets, uh, trying to predict the future. So look at a few frames and train a system to predict what the next frame is gonna look like. Um, and I'm not gonna go to the details of this. It's a convolutional net and it's trained with adversarial training and adversarial training criterion. If you don't use that, if you train it just with a least square, for example, what you get is a blurry image because the best thing the system can do is basically predict an average of all the possible futures that may happen. And so you get a, a blurry, uh, results, 
And so we trained this with adversarial training, which I'm not going to go into the details of, but I'm just going to show you uh, a few animations. So here, these are animations with six frames each, and the first four frames are, are real, are observed, and the last two frames of each, each uh, segment is predicted. Um, and it works okay. Uh, it works pretty good. There's a little bit of blurring. There's a bit of kind of contrast change, but the thing figures out that the leg has to move in one direction, and the, you know, the uh, eyeliner or whatever moves in a particular direction. The baby is moving in a particular direction, etc. So this is sort of a very first step. There's only a, a few papers on this kind of topic, maybe uh, half a dozen, but I think it's a very promising uh, uh, problem that will allow us to make progress in unsupervised learning, and we really need to solve the problem of unsupervised learning. That's going to you know, allow us to take the next step in, 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 uh, in progress in computer vision, but not just computer vision, also AI in general. Thank you very much. We have time for one question, so are there any questions? Um, one thing that I was wondering about with the very recent results on 150 layers, um, and this question maybe David could pipe in as well on, isn't it the case that the human visual system has relatively few layers, at least for the action paths that require immediate response? It's surprisingly shallow. So do you have any thoughts about that? Well, so of course there is the well-known hierarchy of uh, you know, retinal LG, NV1, V2, V4, IT. So it would look like there is only a few layers. Now within each of those um, area, there might be multiple layers. And the more important thing is that each of those layers is recurrent. So in fact, uh, if you wait long enough, uh, you know, fast perception of everyday object is very fast, and so that's essentially a feed-forward process. But there, you know, if you stare at something before getting an interpretation, you get an effect of, of feedback, and you have local feedback in the layers. We also have feedback from uh, upper areas to, uh, to lower areas, um, and that has to be useful to something. And, and so, in effect, the number of layers, if you want, might be much bigger than we think. So let's, let's congratulate Jan again.